In this video, I plan on discussing existential elimination, a derivation rule for predicate logic. I'll start the video by explaining what existential elimination involves. Then I'll talk a little bit about some features of the rule. And finally, I'll end with some examples of how to use existential elimination and how not to use existential elimination. So let's talk through the formulation of the rule, and then we'll break it down a little bit further in some in the following slides. The first thing to note about existential elimination is that it's an elimination rule. This means that we reason from an existentially quantified formula to another formula. So how existential elimination works is we begin with an existentially quantified formula, and then we make an assumption that is based upon this existentially quantified formula. That formula involves the removal of the existential quantifier and its replacement of existentially quantified variables with names. But the names that we pick have to meet certain restrictions. Namely, the name A, let's say we picked A, cannot occur in any premise or any active part of the proof. So a somewhat simplified way of thinking about this is when we make an assumption based upon the existentially quantified expression, this name here needs to be foreign or arbitrary or not already found in the proof. Once we've made this assumption, we can reason to a formula, let's just call this formula psi, and then relying upon the existential quantifier and the subproof, we can reason to psi. But this formula psi also needs to meet certain restrictions, namely the restriction that the name that we assumed in the subproof is not found in psi. So in short, existential elimination allows us to reason from an existentially quantified formula and using a subproof that's initially based upon this existentially quantified expression, reason to a formula psi. Let's take a look at this rule in a little bit more detail. The first thing to know about existential elimination is that it's an elimination rule again. So this means we always need to have an existentially quantified expression in order to start the process of using this particular rule. If you don't have an existentially quantified formula, then you cannot make use of existential elimination. Next, existential elimination does not, it doesn't allow us to reason from formulas like someone is a murderer to John is a murderer. If this were a valid form of reasoning, then we wouldn't need to do any type of investigation in order to solve murders or anything like that. We could just say, well, someone did this, well, it must be this individual right there at the scene of the crime or something like that. The reason for this is because the existentially quantified expression, such that, for example, EX, MX, this formula is true provided at least one individual in the domain has the property M or has the property of being a murderer, but we don't know which one of those items it is from the domain. We just know that if this is true, there is one, but it doesn't specify which one. In contrast, the statement like John is a murderer picks out a specific individual. It says this individual right here, John, he has the property of being a murderer. So one way of thinking about the existentially quantified formula is its reference is vague or indirect or unclear, whereas the use of names picks out a specific individual. However, even if we don't know the exact referent of someone in someone is a murderer, we might temporarily give a name to that individual and reason from that. That is, we don't know the referent of someone is a murderer, but we might use a name temporarily, let's say John Doe, that has the role of picking out some random individual that we don't know anything about, other than the fact that we are ascribing this individual has the property of being a murderer. This use of a name that temporarily refers to an object, one of the features of existential elimination. What occurs is that we assume a well-formed formula that's based upon the existentially quantified formula, and that formula contains a name. And this name temporarily refers to the same object that's picked out by the existentially quantified variable. Then we reason from that particular formula. So for example, let's say we had a statement like EX, MX. We make an assumption and say, well, let's say A. The, the object picked out by A is the murderer. Now what A is doing here is not picking out a specific individual, but one of the things that we need to be careful of is that this A, this name that we make use of in our assumption right here, this A doesn't do more work than it should. 
that it doesn't do more than just simply pick out some random item in the domain. We don't want it picking out a specific individual that we know the identity of. Because we, we don't want the name A to do more work than it should, this is why we need restrictions on the use of existential elimination, particularly on when we make the assumption and when we reason to a formula and derive that formula out of the subproof. We'll put restrictions on both the, our, our assumption and the formula that we reason to in order to ensure that the name A doesn't pick out a specific individual. Let's walk through an example use of existential elimination. First, every use of existential elimination starts with an existentially quantified expression. So you can see at line one, you have the existentially quantified expression EXPX. Second, we can't reason directly from EXPX to PA. Instead, what we'll need to do is make use of an assumption that is built upon or based upon the existentially quantified expression that occurs earlier in the proof. Here we assume PA. What we're doing is letting A temporarily refer to the object picked out by the existentially quantified variable at line one. But you'll remember that there are certain restrictions on which name we can pick. We can't pick a name that whose object we already know the identity of. Instead, we need to pick a name that is foreign or new or not already found in an active part of the proof. Since there aren't any names found in this proof already, we can pick A, but we could have easily picked B or C or D. So the key thing to note is since we don't know what X refer to, we don't know what the X essentially quantified variable X refers to, the name A cannot already have a determined reference. Remember when someone says someone is a murderer, they aren't telling you who exactly is that individual. They're still simply saying there's at least one individual from all the individuals that we might be discussing that has this particular property. So we're letting this name A refer to that individual and nothing more. The next step is to reason in the subproof to a formula that does not contain the name that we assumed at line two. And so that occurs at line four. At line three, we make use of disjunction introduction to reason to PA or QA. At line three, we make use of existential introduction to reason to the formula EX, PX, or QX. And then at line five, since line four does not contain the name A, there's no A found in this formula, we can make use of existential elimination relying upon line one and the subproof found in lines two through four to reason to this final formula found in the subproof. So again, there's a couple things to remember when we make use of existential elimination. Remember that existential elimination is a fairly involved rule and we can't reason directly from an existentially quantified formula to a specific individual. It requires that we have an existentially quantified formula and it requires a subproof based upon that existentially quantified formula. The second thing to keep in mind is that there are restrictions associated with existential elimination and you wanna make sure you pay attention to these. The first is that the name that we assume is not found in any premise or any active part of the proof. So essentially you wanna make sure that the name that you use to replace the existentially quantified variables is completely new. The second is that any names that you assume aren't found in the formula that you're discharging from the subproof. In this first example, we see that we begin with an existentially quantified expression at line one, EXPX. Then we make an assumption based upon this first formula, this first existentially quantified expression, and we replace each existentially quantified variable with a name. And since there's only one, we pick the name A. The key thing again to remember is that this name A is not found in any active part of the proof. Then at line three, we make use of existential introduction to reason two, there exists a Y such a PY. And then at line four, we make use of existential elimination relying upon line one and the subproof contained at lines two through three to reason to the final formula in the subproof. And this is an acceptable use of existential elimination because we didn't violate the restriction that the name cannot be found in the formula that we're discharging from the subproof. Let's look at some violations of existential elimination. Here we start with a proof that has an existentially quantified expression in it at line one. And at line two, we have a formula MB then AC. And we might understand this MB then AC as, if Bob is a murderer, then Kathy is Bob's accomplice. At line three, we make the assumption based upon line one that Bob is the murderer. 
So we're making this assumption because, as you see later in the proof, we plan on using existential elimination. Now this is a violation of that first restriction. The first restriction says that when we make this assumption based upon the existentially quantified expression, that name B cannot already be found in the an active part of the proof, and specifically it can't be found in the premises. Line four is acceptable to make you it's it's an instance of conditional elimination. And then at line five, we make use of existential elimination, relying upon line one and the subproof lines three through four. But ultimately, this is not an acceptable use of existential elimination because we violate this first restriction that this B, the name that we pick, needs to be foreign. And intuitively, we could see that were we to translate this into English, the conclusion would not follow from the premises. That is, if we have premise one, which says someone is a murderer, and premise two, which says if Bob is a murderer, then Kathy is Bob's accomplice to murder, we are able to reason using the incorrect use of existential elimination to Kathy is Bob's accomplice to murder. But we haven't already established that Bob is the murderer. We simply just assumed it at line three that he is, and then made use of existential elimination to derive this conclusion incorrectly. Finally, let's take a look at the violation of the second restriction on existential elimination. Here you'll note at line one, we have an existentially quantified expression. At line two, we make an assumption based upon that existentially quantified expression, replacing the existentially quantified variables with A. And this is okay, this isn't a violation of restriction one because those names A are not already found in an active part of the proof. At line three, we make use of existential introduction, and this is an acceptable use of existential introduction. We're replacing one of the names with an existentially quantified variable. The problem with this proof is at line four. At four, we take the formula that we derived in this subproof and pull it out of the subproof. That is, we reason from line one and lines two through three to line four. But what we haven't done is ensure that this formula does not contain any names that we've assumed. And so this is a violation of the second restriction right here. We wanna make sure that the formula that we derive out of the subproof does not contain any names we, uh, we've assumed. And you can see how this would, you could see not be an acceptable way of reasoning. Just from the fact that someone loves themselves, it wouldn't follow that Alfred loves someone. So going back to our formulation of existential elimination, what existential elimination states is that from an existentially quantified expression and a subproof where the assumption of the subproof is built upon the existentially quantified expression by removing the existential quantifier and replacing all of the existentially quantified variables with names and those names are arbitrarily introduced or to put it in another way, those names do not play an active role in the proof. So from this assumption, we can reason to a formula, let's say this formula is psi, and if this formula psi does not contain any of the names that we've assumed, then we can, using existential elimination, derive psi from the existentially quantified expression and the subproof.